So thank you for being here, everyone. I think that I will uh, talk for a few minutes and then I'll guide us in some relational practice, okay? And we'll have time for questions and interaction. Does anyone already and immediately have a question arising that would be helpful tonight related to sitting meditation or the sit you just had? Anyone? Yes, and say your name. Uh, hi, my name is Matt. Thanks, um, Matt. I had a great kind of whimsical moment and I was like spinning out on some relationship based you know, mind tricks and someone walked by with some kind of like clacker or something. And I was like, that was just the Zen master just showed up and brought me back. Waking you up. Yeah. So just someone walking by outside that particular sound was kind of what you needed to be popped out of your kind of self-referencing bubble in that moment and come back to, yeah? Exactly right. Wonderful, wonderful. And so just that sound brought you back to the field of interconnection, the field of interconnected presence, yeah? And so consider even just today as you reflect on this day, uh, a moment in which uh, something either woke you up, uh, helpfully reminded you of interconnection when you were caught in that bubble, that self-referencing I versus you bubble, perhaps, uh, or when an engagement with another and the willingness from yourself or the other to be uh, open and receptive helped to wake you up. Anyone have one of those moments today? Raise your hand. Okay, great. I had, I had one of those moments today. So this evening I want to talk about uh, relational practice and I want to also speak to the context of the extraordinary nature of ordinary self, okay? If there was a talk for tonight, that's what it would be. And I, um, I have no idea what I'll say tonight, but I find this topic very juicy. And so just to begin, um, hmm. Wow, there's such a large hole in the fabric of human relationship right now. Uh, we see it in our country, and we see it globally. It's huge. Each of us who has a practice has an incredible opportunity to, as part of our own awakening, wake up to our participation in the healing of that hole. Are people with me? And yet so often there's a strange distortion that meditators carry. I know because I once carried this distortion. The distortion is um, I'm meditating to find my own peace and well-being on the cushion. And yet I can't bring the same quality of presence, the same quality of compassionate neutrality, of deep <coughs> listening, really to the, the super busy, very social, uh, difficult, challenging, people-filled aspects of my life, right? So many times, far too often than is necessary, people will go on retreat and see retreat as this place. Ah, oh, now I can come home to myself. Now I can find the refuge within. Now I can remember what really feels true. But I'm going back out into the world out there as if it's separate, and I absolutely can't maintain the same quality of presence. And I've had people tell me before, authenticity, I can't. I can't be transparent and vulnerable and really authentic at my workplace. You should see it, okay? Uh, I can't bring uh, deep listening and truth speaking to my family dynamics. Are you kidding? Um, really? So consider for a moment that even if we live to be 100 years old, we are here for a brief and fleeting moment. So do we really want to live our lives under this delusion, this distortion, that we don't have what it takes through our practice to meet every interaction we ever have from, uh, we could say, authenticity, awareness, just using the relational field as a mirror in a much more engaged and nuanced way. Uh, love, love is the word I would use. 
Love is such an interesting word because in our society, the, the language, the word love, has kind of just been uh, shit on. It's kind of been taken over by, I mean, really, Hallmark cards and weird pink bad art in hotel rooms. And <laughs> this strange, uh, weird idealization of romantic love as some like, if you're lucky, you'll find the one and you'll fly off to, I don't know, into the sunset together is what it is. We have really strange distortions about love. Equal to that, we get confused about compassion, thinking that it's always just supposed to be kind of gentle and soft, or, or that it's an ideal that uh, the Buddha could meet, but I could never meet. I can't access what compassionate action is in this moment. Are people following me? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm really happy, more than happy, to uh, speak the language of and the, the, use the term love. <laughs> I think we need to reclaim it, because I think all of Dharma practice is essentially a teaching about love. When we're on the cushion and when we're in life, uh, meeting this human experience, which offers us uh, so much beauty and opportunity for uh, transcendence and offers us so much pain and messiness and stickiness and difficulty sometimes, right? So to remember through all of it, we have the simple capacity to meet what arises with love. And that's our invitation as practitioners. <clears throat> Sometimes this looks like just showing up. Think about the tenacity. Tenacity is love, by the way, required to just show up to your practice sometimes when it gets really hard. That's love. <laughs> Sometimes it looks like being willing to step back just enough to be with what's in your experience that's triggering with kind neutrality rather than getting stuck in it, glued to it. Yeah? Sometimes it looks incredibly soft and tender when I asked you at the end of that sit to rest your hand on your heart and give yourself uh, compassion. How many of you felt like that was just an invitation to spend a couple minutes uh, loving up yourself? Yeah? Yeah, 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 we need it. And one of the things that gets in the way of bringing love to the relational field and that gets in the way of genuine connection, so being able to experience our capacity of love with one another. I could also use the word intimacy with one another, just genuine connection, the kind that we actually need to survive. We, we become like undernourished plants when we don't have it, okay? One of the things that gets in the way is um, a fixation that a lot of human beings have, a fixation or kind of distraction around special, not special, this duality. Am I special? Am I being seen as special? Maybe I'm not special. Maybe I need to do more to become special. They're special. I see it in them. What else can I do to maintain or achieve specialness, OK? And I just invite you to reflect on my words for a moment. And rather than just believing what I'm saying, check in with yourself and notice if this kind of, at times perhaps, or maybe every day, depending on who you are, if this <clears throat> illusion around specialness gets in the way of your authentic expression and your real acceptance of self. Can I see a show of hands if anyone relates to what I'm pointing to? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes before we, uh, well, let's just say oftentimes when we first come to practice and for a period of time, we're motivated through uh, what I would call the myth of self-improvement. A lot of people, and it's really popular in our culture, right? <laughs> Um, and so through this myth of self-improvement, meditation, the Dharma, is going to become another way, another thing we can reach out to and pick up and uh, fix this broken self, improve this person who I've been observing. She needs a lot of improvement, right? Um, somehow fix, change, solve, or improve ourself. If we continue to practice, however, we see <clears throat> that that particular motivation uh, well, we see that it's a myth, the myth of self-improvement. We get to a place of actually 
getting a clue about the larger implications of our practice for healing, for accessing the already awakened <laughs> state, and for, I would suggest, healing our world, right? We begin to see how much uh, energy maintenance, energy um, is going into maintaining this self-improvement thing. So we have to be judging ourselves, yeah? We have to be monitoring ourselves. We have to be pretty much comparing ourselves to others. That's a busy task. We have to be taking in some of the external messages that are huge in our distorted economy right now that are feeding. Uh, you are all broken and not good enough. So buy this product and it'll make you better, right? Or do this practice and it'll make you better. So I bring up this, this myth of self-improvement because as we meditate and as we become more um, available to just being and letting go of some of this uh, efforting and judging <laughs> and trying to fix ourselves, then we can start to really, really settle in to knowing ordinary self. Knowing ordinary self. <clears throat> well, when I speak of ordinary self, I could also use the language uh, essence. We get still enough and we settle in enough and we get quiet enough to just begin to actually know our essence. How many of you in this room have experienced that gift maybe time and time again in practice? Maybe it's language you use in your daily practice, but raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I just want us to consider for a moment, uh, and I feel tenderness as I talk about this because it makes me incredibly sad to look out in the world and see so many incredible human beings. Rather than knowing the extraordinary nature of their ordinary self, that means who they already are without having to do, fix, or change, or improve anything. That means that place we get more in touch with just through presence. That for so many human beings, Instead of even seeing that, they look right over it and go immediately to the collective assumption that I'm not special enough, I'm not good enough, there's something wrong with me, and so I'm going to stay identified with this ego and this ego maintenance. Yeah? It brings me tremendous sadness when I think about that. So in conscious circles in particular, something I've noticed is we can be aware of self-improvement. We can be aware of um, self-acceptance as a very engaged practice. And yet we can still get kind of sideswiped, seduced by this illusion of special, not special. This is why I'm talking about this tonight, particularly in conscious circles. It's a slippery place. In a few minutes, I'll ask you, after I've talked a bit more, to get into pairs and to just reflect a little bit on what you see within yourself about this. But just right now, as you're listening, take a deep breath. And just notice how what I'm sharing relates to you personally. <clears throat> Consider what your own relationship is currently with assessing or monitoring yourself with Considering the special or not special, how am I being perceived? How do others see me? 
notion. And just consider if any of your life force goes to that story. So as someone who's deeply passionate about relational mindfulness and who's deeply passionate about um, helping us to remember the interconnection that it's who we already are, we could talk about it. And if we just sat in silence for the next hour, we would have no confusion about uh, our inherent interconnection, okay? But as someone who's passionate about this topic, I really um, find it interesting <laughs> that the more, even as practitioners, we feed our own self-referencing bubble in ways we're not honest with ourselves about, okay? The more we allow for disconnect rather than connect the more we feed a uh, superficial way of engaging with each other, even if we say that's not what we're about, okay? Hmm. I'm present to um, really being curious with how these reflections are landing with you. If you have that experience inside yourself of I'm aware of sometimes not really being fully honest with how maintaining my self-referencing bubble, okay, gets in the way of what my heart really wants or is really here for. People following? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have such an a incredible opportunity in practice uh, to, to be here, to be aware that there is a self-referencing bubble <laughs> that we are um, identifying with falsely case of mistaken identity, okay? It's not who we are, and yet, at least in the world I inherited and have grown up in, there's so much messaging encouraging us to live in this bubble. In fact, I would say the more someone lives in a self-referencing bubble, the more rewarded they get by conventional society. I found that very interesting, okay? And yet, uh, it's in this bubble that we suffer because we're in this bubble alone with the mind of separation. And the mind of separation, of course, is the continual assessments, stories, past, future focus. Uh, I know you don't need the education. You, you know this mind of separation. <laughs> but I'm just reminding you. I call this a conditioned mind, the mind of separation, because it does so deeply cause disconnect in our relationship with ourself. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to hear my own true voice when this was speaking so loudly to me in my life. So I wasn't able to speak from my true voice. I wasn't able to see the inherent uh, beauty of my imperfection, my essence as Eden, <laughs> when I was so fully devoted to this and its assessments and comparisons. I suspect everyone in this room can relate, yeah? So this mind of separation disconnects us from our authentic self, our essence. And it also causes disconnect in the field with one another because I could be here listening to you, but I'm not really fully listening. I'm not dropped in. I'm really listening to my own mind. Assess what you're saying or plan what I'm going to say when it's my turn or uh, think about what I'm doing tomorrow. <laughs> Right? It also causes separation between me and the natural world, the larger world, because I'm just not home. I'm not here in my full attunement, in the place of deep listening and receptivity that as a human animal is who I am. I'm interconnected to everything and everyone everywhere. I can feel the pain of something happening across the globe, but if I'm stuck, in this self-referencing bubble, it's really loud and distracting. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> and so just to reflect, we don't have to take it personally and we don't have to ever judge ourselves or another for being seduced by it.
but it only has the power of the energy that we give it, the attention we give it. So in practice, we're remembering that the quality of our life experience is determined by the focus of our attention. And we show up to sit and to engage in relational practice so we can uh, cultivate our attention being here, being home. Yeah? And I think I'll say a little bit more about the word extraordinary when I'm talking about ordinary self. So I know that for most of us, um, we're quite aware of how loud conditioning is. It speaks to us loudly, redundantly, If you listen to it enough and pay attention, you see that it's absolutely a replaying loop or record, right? And so again, when we're giving it our attention, we're just not available to hear that which is more subtle. Uh, The still small voice within, we could say. We're so busy up here doing Okay, and striving that we forget to just spend time being with and enjoying uh, ordinary self, what's here underneath, and that's what we get to get in touch with on the cushion. Okay, ordinary self is not calling out for attention, it doesn't have any reference point for special, non special, it, it's not self conscious, <laughs> it doesn't have any. Uh, reference point for judgment. It's just how life animates each and every one of us, which is uh, completely different and unique for every single being here. And so what's fascinating is, while we might be trying kind of through ego to hopefully be special, (laughs) to hopefully make the grade, to hopefully be special enough, uh, our essence is, is already extraordinary. There's no doing required to meet our potential. It's just about undoing so we can get in touch with just what's here, this inherent goodness, yeah? I'm enjoying as I talk the uh, sounds that come through the space. I find it it's so lovely. I mean, in terms of interconnection, the birds chirping and the cars moving through, and I'm sure you already are aware of how useful it is for practice, given it's hard to find a perfectly silent place sometimes, yeah? So I really am appreciating this. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. The idea for this book that I've written uh, began to come through uh, after I made a, a move, a strange move, from a silent Zen monastery where I had practiced for seven and a half years to the city of Los Angeles, of all places. Not a move I recommend to anyone. (laughs) And um, it was a a wild ride. I had not known that I had uh, contracted Lyme disease when I was a a monk, and that's uh, clear now. But I had not known, and so we needed for me to leave the monastery for a spell. We thought a few months to go and get some medical care. Uh, anyone here who's dealt with chronic illness knows that it's, it's high-level practice, and it's also an incredible teacher in what we were talking about before, love. Okay? And so in that time, I uh, just had a real clear heart call. Oh, my gosh, I have been so insanely blessed by support for practice. It's time to live in the city that when I was 17, I left and vowed to never again moved to this. I saw it then as a teenager as a very overconsumptive place. Now I see it as an incredibly creative and overconsumptive place. <laughs> and so <laughs> I moved back to LA and I just got clear about the need in myself and certainly in everyone I was teaching and guiding for a lot more support for relational intelligence, for the Dharma of how we relate. Yeah? How many of you feel like you could use some more support? 
for that realm. Yeah. And so I'm just briefly going to share some of the principles that the book is based upon. I see relational mindfulness as a set of practices, certainly formal practices, but also uh, nine main principles that we're invited to bring into every aspect of our life, every engagement we have. And these principles, from my perspective, are simply that which we learn in sitting meditation. Very, very simple. Uh, the first is intention. Just knowing. Ego's got pretty clear intentions, folks. And it starts with one word, separation. And so if we're not clear in our heart's intention as we engage with one another, it's pretty likely that this will try to climb in. Ego's intention. The second is the sacred pause. So just right now as I'm talking, pause and connect with your breath. And take a minute, minute is all it takes, to observe what's happening in your mind, in your physical body. your emotional body. Just pausing as we engage with one another so that we can stay fully connected within ourself while we're with the other. So that ultimately we can uh, erase that <coughs> separate self lens and just be here open to one another. Uh, Buddha taught that there is no self and other. Okay. Just on level of practicality, consider how often you've been uh, in a conflict or um, triggered by something someone says to you, and that just that invitation to take one minute, not even that, 30 seconds, <laughs> to reconnect within, okay, can help you to, rather than fall into reactivity or a habit pattern, um, get clear, get clear. So the third is deep listening. And deep listening is the essence of a meditation practice. Learning to, to listen to life as it unfolds moment by moment. We're certainly learning to, to listen to ourselves more deeply, again, so that we can actually be more in touch with, uh, with our true self. It's what's underneath some of the superficial chatter. And certainly to listen to one another. Uh, more deeply. How many of you have a, a practice of deep listening or perhaps in your community as well that's already very active and alive? And if you do, raise your hand if you find it one of the most exquisitely beautiful ways of connecting that is possible. <laughs> so deep listening is an act of love. And yet we are in the society right now with, especially with social media and cell phones and texting and that on top of the regular distractions, where we're in more need than ever for deep listening. The next principle in relational practice is transparency. And this is a really important one. I was talking with some students today about how there's certain areas they've gotten to real acceptance with parts of themselves they didn't <coughs> used to accept through practice. And yet they were still witnessing themselves want to hide those parts from others. So like, I accept this now, but I still don't want to share this with you. Anyone know that place? Or I still don't want others to see this. That's not useful, folks. Cut it out. It's not useful. It, it takes away from others the opportunity to see us as we are and love us. And it takes away from us the opportunity to take acceptance to another level. If I really accept me as I am, uh, broken and perfectly imperfect and human, okay, and then I can see others and their humanness as well, then I really want to engage with others from this place that we're just seeing one another as we are and we're uh, coming from more acceptance and sometimes it feels risky to be transparent. People know that place, yeah? It's a practice. It's a very nuanced practice, but it's important. <laughs> so let's see. I'm just going to name a handful more before we open it up. I do want to share with you the, the principles, and that might seed some of your questions. Um, the next one is 
not taking personally. <coughs> and so just in sitting meditation, when I was asking you to meet your experience with kind neutrality, that is an invitation to not take personally, right? To be with what's moving through without uh, making meaning about it. That goes back to your, what this means about me. <laughs> and think about how often in human relationship, taking personally just causes a mess. Yeah? Anyone? It definitely adds fire to separation and conflict. The next is taking responsibility. Sometimes we want the other person to take responsibility, not me, okay? But the Dharma is a practice that invites us to uh, continue to step it up and go deeper, and it invites us into a kind of spiritual uh, maturing, and that's all about taking responsibility. And the thing that happens is um, we realize even though my ego doesn't like this, like I want someone else to, <laughs> my heart loves it. My heart loves it. It's, it's joyful responsibility to take responsibility for my stuff and to be committed to knowing my stuff that much more fully so it doesn't leak out. Yeah? The next is um, <sighs> mindful inquiry and clear seeing. Okay? And so when we do get caught, and we all do sometimes. It can be triggering out there, the field of relationship. We have an invitation to just pause and bring more curiosity to inquire simply into uh, who's here right now as I'm engaging. Is what I'm being told by conditioning actually true? Okay. And Mindful inquiry is something that I could give a whole teaching just on that topic, but I'm going to simply name it tonight. And the final one is compassionate action. Okay, so when we practice these gifts that we learn from sitting meditation, as we engage with one another, we're much more uh, positioned and available to receive compassionate or skillful action, to respond, again, rather than react, to respond uh, on behalf of the whole, and the whole includes ourself, okay? Not compassionate action as a thought exercise, what should I do here, or if I was more enlightened, <laughs> what I do, or what's right or wrong to do, but just, I'm, I'm present enough, and my, I'm seeing clearly enough, okay, that I can sense what love would do here. Let's all pause for a moment and just close our eyes. And just reflect within yourself on how the mind of separation sometimes causes disconnect for you in the relational field. You might reflect if there was particularly one of the principles I named that would be useful for you right now in your practice of relating. You might consider uh, if the topic, the fixation of special, not special, uh, feels alive for you, if that could be freeing for you to pay more attention to, okay? And I would like to invite us into a very short uh, relational practice, just a short opportunity to share with one another. And so can everyone who's here just turn towards a partner, a person sitting closest to you would be fine. And then raise your hand if you don't have a partner. (laughs) 
So if anyone is without a partner, raise your hand. This is amazing. OK. And now that you have your partner and you're all connecting, please allow for silence. Allowing yourself to return to silence. What I'm going to ask you to do in a moment is just to uh, actually, let's see, decide who has the longer hair. Longer hair person will speak first. And what you will do is um, just share any reflections. You'll just have a couple of minutes, but any reflections with your partner based on what I've spoken about tonight, how they relate to you. And your partner's job is to do nothing but listen, just to let your body relax, to listen, not adding anything, not asking any questions, for everyone to be paying attention to um, what happens inside as we just listen and as we are listened to, okay? And so I'll ring a bell when it's time to switch, and uh, this is just another extension of your meditation tonight. So any questions before we begin? Okay, begin. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So pausing, bringing whatever you're sharing to a close for now. Closing your eyes and turning your attention within. Just taking in a couple of breaths. And noticing the internal landscape. So that we can stay fully connected within ourselves as we engage with one another. And now switch, and the other person will share and receive just listening.
Okay, so thank your partner, and then bring your attention back this way. Okay, so let's open the field uh, for questions, for reflections, perhaps something that you noticed in the questions I asked or in the sharing you just had with your partner. Let's open the field. Who would like to start us off? Yes, and share your name. My name is Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. Um, we were just talking, and there was a, a, from my partner, there was this discussion of transparency, the, 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 how transparency landed for, for him. And, and what landed for me was that in, in being completely transparent, what really landed for me was that idea of special, not special. I spent my whole life <laughs> striving all day long, every day, to be special. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And early on in my practice, I was blessed with the insight of that's exhausting and it's so much more satisfying to just be a regular guy and just be like. <coughs> to let go of trying to be special mm -hmm. and to just mm -hmm. be who I am, yes. not project constantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you became aware early on in your practice that right. the intense amount of energy, of life force, every day going to striving to make the special right. mark, right? To make that mark. Right. And you were able at that point in your practice to just relax more into uh, being, you said, well, your, your ordinary self, you as you are. And for each of us to just consider for a moment, um, it's not surprising that we get caught in this delusion with so much of the conditioned messages from our culture. Think about how each and every one of us has kind of internalized this dividing line that says there are parts of me who are lovable and acceptable, and thus parts of humanity, right? And parts of me who are not. And so I need to spend a tremendous amount of time and energy and work striving, right? To push away the bad parts, again, of me and thus humanity. We all share all of it. And to maintain or try to be seen <laughs> in the good parts. Wow, think about the needs on our planet right now for, um, a more regenerative model of living, for a new paradigm, for new ways of working with nature. Think of all the things we could be doing with our energy now. And instead, consider the amount of human energy that's going to this delusion, battling this dividing line we've all internalized. People with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So each and every one of us who's willing to say, gosh, I, I think it's time for me to access the courage to let this line dissolve. And guess what? Through transparency and relational presence to help other people dissolve theirs, that frees us from this bubble of separation and suffering. And it 
positions us for all of this life force to be offered up for, uh, I would say, on behalf of the greater good, which includes ourself, okay? Yes, your name, again. Denny. Thank you. Uh, this was a conversation that's been happening for me today. Mm -hmm. So coming here uh, was actually really great, but uh, uh, I deal with depression. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. especially after last week, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of talk around suicide. And, and um, I was in an argument with two of my really close friends, and I wrote this really long letter about uh, my depression mm -hmm. and where it came from. And, some abuse as a kid and stuff like that, and uh, so I could share with them. That's why I that's why I acted out in this way. But then uh, this weekend I was like super depressed. I didn't I didn't go out of the house. And then um, today it was this 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 realization that not only am I going to share it with them, but I want to put this on Facebook, and I can share it with my broader community. So this mm -hmm. conversation is a, is a deeper conversation. And people just saying, hey, let's reach out to other friends or whatever. But like, um, it's, a, it's a bigger conversation. And that transparency, when my teacher talks about not having secrets, when we don't have secrets with people, we're, we're, we can show up authentically. Right? And um, so, yeah, it was like, it was really powerful to hear you say, just put that into words. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I can be part of that large, larger conversation that one in five Americans deal with depression. Yes. Anxiety. Yes, yeah. Thank you for speaking up about that. Uh, I want to thank you, one, for just bringing up some of the events of last week and the reminder we all received of, wow, the suicide rate has gone up that much higher in our country. We sensed it, but just to hear that number. And, uh, you know, I've spoken a bit about uh, deep listening and transparency tonight to consider the degree to which uh, each and every one of us, in order to survive and thrive, needs to be listened to, needs uh, compassionate um, neutral, non-judgmental witnesses, uh, and also how many people don't have it, okay? So each and every one of us through our practice who's willing to become more of a generous listener, a deep listener. Back to what you were saying, you had clear seeing to be aware that this conversation about my depression and my experience of it, I want to bring it, I'm ready to bring it more out of the personal to share with everyone, to share with everyone, that that would serve, that level of transparency. And so just to note, what often happens is we think we're the only ones going through whatever it is, our version of human suffering, our struggle. And if we keep it inside, and if we don't speak up about it, then we're just sort of, it's like being locked in the closet with the perpetrator. It's like being locked in the closet with our own conditioned mind, our own self-hatred. People know what I'm pointing to? And so always in practice, and this is an absolute rule in practice, to uh, get an arm's length distance through either writing about it or speaking about it to, to get yourself out of that uh, closet of aloneness is where the, the healing can occur, okay? Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, what's your name? My name's Kyle. Thanks, Kyle. Um, I, I'm hoping I can say this coherently because it has a lot of aspects to it, but um, professionally I have a new book coming out too and um, I have to do some promotion for it and um, it's been a long time since I've done any sort of self-promotion mm -hmm. and um, I just moved here from New York. When I first moved to New York, it was all about that. It was all about trying to um, state my claim and make my name and I got covered pretty bad. You got clobbered pretty, clobbered pretty badly. Mm-hmm. I got some walls there, and um, and so I retreated, you know, in a, in a really good way. Um, you know, here at the center, people probably don't really notice me. I'm pretty dour here, but there's another side of myself that's very stagey and theatrical. Mm -hmm. It's not a false self. It's just a different side. Of it's me. an aspect of yourself. Aspect we have myself. many different aspects of yeah. the self. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and it really steps forward. And, and, you know, there's a sort of strength to it that I can kind of get lost in, and I'm finding myself in in uh, not wanting to go into that specialness arena. Yeah. On the other hand, I do have to do some work for promotion of this book. Yeah. And I do have to do some public um, uh, appearances. Okay. For, and um, 
I'm really afraid uh -huh. of running back into the same trouble that I got into uh -huh. years ago. Uh -huh. Yeah. Let me ask you first, uh, do you trust your practice to help you meet this in a new way? At this point, yeah. I had okay. a practice back then, but it wasn't as strong. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you next, what is the name of your book? Oh, uh, the name of the book is called Cockloft Scenes from a Gay Marriage. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. So let's do some, some promotion for your book. Say the name out loud again. Cockloft Scenes from a Gay Marriage. Fabulous. Okay. So a couple things I'm going to just speak indirectly to this. Okay. And first, I'll share that Again, we have so many different aspects of the self, and never in practice are we working on, on like cutting off a part of ourself or saying, oh, that's ego, so I'm going to get rid of that. What we're working on doing more is knowing how to be aware of all the different aspects of the self, which all carry light and shadow, right? Uh, depending on the situation we're in, it might be really useful to call upon that extroverted theatrical one, but in another situation, pretty obnoxious. Right? And so, <laughs> and so the whole point is to not allow ego to be in the driver's seat, to find our center. And in practice, we're cultivating our capacity to trust uh, center. And so to trust our ability to discern. Uh, and then we can call upon different aspects of themselves rather than just finding one acting out because we went unconscious and that's what happened. You, you with me? Oh, I am. Yeah. There's also side Sure. Um, you know, it was basically me and my partner, we were like the two people in the world, you know, and, and, I, and I found it difficult to engage with others when I wasn't um, having that same persona take the lead. And so there's another um, aspect to that where um, behind that persona there's as I was speaking with Brian, I realized there was a fear that I would be extinguished if I didn't um, have some sort of public, um, I'm trying to avoid the word persona, I'm going to use it okay. sometimes, but mm -hmm. personality, mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. would be somewhat attractive or somewhat engaging. I like to invite you just into an inquiry, just into bringing more curiosity to this. Um, even this word pr promotion or self-promotion, uh, I get a sense of some of the qualities you're wanting to avoid by not falling into conventional self-promotion, what we've all seen, what kind of like just being markety entails, right? And uh, we can say that's a bit different from coming from authenticity. At the same time, as long as we have a practice that's solid enough, if it's useful, it's of, it's, if it is of service to the larger whole or of service to your vision with this book to share it with people, to let people know about it, there's absolutely certainly a way for you to um, promote, okay, or for you to be vocal about that without falling into what feels like a false self. In other words, you have a true voice inside, use it. Your true voice and your uh, theatrical part could work together on this, but it's not something you've done in the past. So I just invite you to consider that that inquiry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. Your name? I'm Josh. Hi, Josh. So I'm actually somebody who's been told he was special all, like, all my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like, I went to a high school for gifted kids. That was kind of what, it, what the brand was. Mm -hmm. So I actually have a lot of conditioning around me being special. Already, yes. Yes. And having to prove that and also that everybody else is not special. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, yeah, so I, I guess it's uh, it's definitely been a really intense and uh, like in the last year I've really seen it for what it is mm -hmm. and how much difficulty it's caused me throughout my life. Uh, and I have a desire to let go of, of the specialness, but I also, um, I really value uh, I mean, I'm a person with very strong values. Yes. I really, you know, I really value education. I'm a musician, I'm an artist, and I want to um, 
find a way of relating to people without feeling like I am sacrificing my values? Yes, yes. I'm going to ask you to pause. And I'm going to speak a little bit indirectly in a way that I think will be useful for everyone. I imagine many people in this room can relate on some level to, I've either received the messages that I'm really special or not special, or for some people, uh, for me, both. Times I received special, special, and times not special. <laughs> okay, Or that message of special uh, created a seed of, uh, that was like a haunting. I might be not special. Oh no, I have to maintain special. I literally developed an introverted part of me because I didn't like it when people said I was special. I, that seemed like something I then had to rise to the occasion to be. D does that make sense? So anyway, what I want to address here is this. You're, a part of you is afraid that if you let go of this special thing, you're going to end up being not special. That's what a part of you is afraid of. You're still believing a duality. Okay? It's not true. It ain't true. What is so is before we kind of deep into a particular place in our practice, we can get very caught in this back and forth between self-aggrandizement over here and self-deprecation. So there we go. Special, not special, special, not special. And it's this dramatic kind of emotional back and forth in our lives. It's a distraction. All of that happens again with as part of this self-referencing bubble. The place that I find most joyful in practice, it takes courage, but it is so utterly joyful. It's actually the place of uh, genuine humility. Humility actually means getting to the place where you're over self-aggrandizement and self-deprecation. <laughs> you're just like, I'm kind of over the self to some degree <laughs> that, I didn't, that I wasn't used to. Because guess what? The self, like me, 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 it's pretty boring. And when I listen more deeply and I actually just let, like I'm, I'm willing to let, to let go enough to hear and see and know my ordinary self. And again, ordinary self is one term I could use. I come from the Zen tradition, so no self, just what's here when there's presence is another thing I could use. Essence or authentic self or true nature, they could all be used. When you really kind of drop into that, you experience a specialness, ironically, <laughs> an extraordinary nature that is so exquisite and so specific to you. No one else carries your essence but you. No one. And yet there's no self-consciousness about it. It's just, oh, I <laughs> finally got it. If I drop all of that worry and all of that doing, this, this energy is here. I want to live with this energy. It feels, it, feels, it feels very incredible. And it's kind. And it's not concerned about... Uh, what people think either. And yet, when pe people get to witness it, they'll love it. <laughs> you with me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So we're actually coming to our time, and I only got to respond to this side of the room. I'm sorry if you had questions over here. I'll be around a little bit afterwards, and uh, we can look at things together. I want to make a few announcements, and uh, the first is that... <laughs> I have a book for sale tonight for those of you who would like to go deeper in these teachings. Um, this is the second book that I've written. The first was about uh, sustainability. This book took a lot more uh, courage and vulnerability. So the reason I'm most, let's say, kind of just proud of it is I truly wrote it from the most vulnerable <laughs> place inside. And so I'm happy to be offering it. And. Um, I also will share that if you want to go deeper in the teachings of uh, relational practice, there's many offerings that I have and retreats that are invitations to go deeper and to really cultivate this in your life. I have one postcard out over there for a retreat this summer with Dave Smith, who some of you might know. We teach in September at Land of Medicine Buddha together in November in Colorado. And uh, I offer many different kinds of retreats and, uh, and trainings. Also, I have an online course coming up that starts in July. And I offer this once a year. It's a four-week course about mindful sexuality and healing the sex-spirit divide. And I began doing this work because I am so um, tired as a woman and a practitioner of just seeing the lack of uh, sexuality 
sex teachings on sexuality brought into our practice, it's very often left out as if it's separate and it's, it's not folks. So um, I love this work. It's really about merging relational intelligence and erotic intelligence and it's very beautiful work. So let me see if there's anything else I'm supposed to announce. Um, hmm. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just share that uh, whenever teachers come here to speak, they're coming from the generosity of their heart and um, the practice of Donna, uh, meeting that teacher and teaching with your generosity is a really beautiful interface. It's deeply appreciated and it's so helpful. It, it's a way you're giving back and offering encouragement for that teacher to continue offering the teachings and to keep um, spreading the seeds of this practice uh, because it's, uh, uh, teachers are vulnerable too. <laughs> we all are. And so that said, uh, I really appreciate your